Hi, I'm Stuart from the Norfolk Honey Company and welcome back to a very sunny February day here at our lakeside apiary. Uh, today we're going to just show you how to sample your colonies for uh, Nosema, so how to take a, a sample of bees for Nosema. Uh, but before we get stuck into that, uh, just a quick reminder that from the beginning of March we'll be launching three videos a week uh, direct to our Patreon page. Uh, if you're not familiar with our Patreon page please do take a look at the details in the description below and I'll leave a link for you to be able to go straight across and check that out. Uh, we've also got, uh, I'm quite excited about our new podcast which will be coming out in the beginning of March as well. Uh, probably release that around B Tradex time. That's already available to some of our patrons. So again, pop over to Patreon and take a look at that if you're into listening to podcasts. So with Nosema, we have uh, a spore-forming parasitic microsporidian. Uh, that's a member of the fungi family. And uh, there are somewhere in a region of over 200 different types of Nosema and uh, honeybees are only affected by two of those, Nosema apis and Nosema serrani and those are the ones that we're going to be testing for. So Nosema generally tends to be a winter problem for beekeepers so as the bees go through the winter uh, and into late winter and into very early spring the Nosema can multiply in the mid gut of the honeybee and one of the kind of better signs of uh, nosema infections is probably lethargy. A lot of people will say that dysentery is, is a, a sure sign, but it's not always the case that uh, you'll see what we call spotting on the outside of the hive, where the bees will come out to go for a toilet break, but they don't fly very far away from the hive because of the lethargy and they end up pooping on the outside of the beehive. So, uh, we're looking at a situation where the colony tends not to build up very strongly in the spring and what I really want to do is to help you understand how that happens, why it happens and more importantly what you as a beekeeper can do about it because although a colony can be infected with Nosema it's what you do uh, to help the bees through that critical period of late February and into spring here, certainly here in the UK, um, that is going to make all the difference as to whether that colony can then shake off the nosema and get through into the summer and be productive. So let's just have a look at the life cycle of the uh, nosema and uh, we can then start to understand a little bit about how they develop in the hive and some of the things that we can do, uh, particularly for the backyard beekeeper, the amateur beekeeper, uh, there are some very simple straightforward steps that you can take that will help you reduce the loading of the nosema in your colony and therefore help the bees to recover more quickly. It's generally not a problem that we suffer from in the summer, so if you have a Nosema infection going through late winter and into early spring, if the bees survive, generally they tend to shrug it off going into the warmer weather, into the nice hot summer, and then it will reappear in the uh, late winter again the following year. And it can be the difference between a colony surviving the winter or, or dying out, but it also has an effect on honey production and so if you're looking to produce some honey then really you want your bees as healthy as possible going into the spring and early summer. So Nosema affects the adult bees within the beehive and uh, generally it can reduce the uh, lifespan of an adult bee uh, by as much as a half so those bees that go into winter once they pick up the Nosema it can really cut through a colony very quickly and in the winter that can have a dramatic effect on your colony because you want as many bees in that colony to maintain the heat and warmth within the cluster through the very cold nights that you have and if you're finding that the bees are dying out then as that cluster reduces in size so the bees have to work even harder to produce the heat in order to maintain that, um, that core temperature and 
If they can't maintain that core temperature, then brood will start to die. If the queen is affected, then it can affect her egg laying and she might well end up dying as well. So then you have a queenless colony going into the spring. And if they do survive, you've then got the problem of trying to either unite them with another colony, but they're infected with a disease, so you don't want to do that. You've got to find a queen, but if you've got everything prepared going into the winter, you might not have a spare queen available. So it can cause uh, quite a few problems for you in the spring. So another problem that you can have with Nosema is it can allow the introduction of uh, viral infections within the colony. So uh, one of the possibly more well-known viruses is uh, black queen cell virus. So if you're then going into the spring and you've got an infection of Nosema, then you could find that when the colony produces queen cells, or if you try to produce queens from that colony, you could end up losing a significant number of those queen cells to black queen cell virus. So it's important that you manage the situation and try to reduce the loading as quickly and as effectively as you can. So if we consider the life cycle of Nosema, uh, if you look closely at the spore and you can see diagrams and there are electron microscope images showing them, if you imagine uh, an egg-shaped spore, inside there is a, a coiled filamentous uh, tubule, a needle, and the coil acts as a spring. So when the spore gets into the mid-gut of the honeybee, it finds an appropriate cell and it's one of the epithelial cells around the mid-gut. It fires the uh, needle, if you like, into that cell and transfers some of its material into that cell. And then that's uh, the nosema starting to then uh, develop and multiply within that cell. A single bee can have millions, tens of millions of viable spores in its midgut. So uh, if one of those bees were to then pass um, feces within the hive, let's say that it is so worn down by this particular disease that it can't get out and fly and it's crawling around on a frame, it's then going to poop and in those feces you're going to have millions of spores. The other bees will then trample that across the frames and spread all of these millions of spores across and throughout the hive. Other bees will then clean up that mess and ingest some of those spores and the cycle then continues. So we need to look at practical ways that we as beekeepers can affect and reduce the loading of those spores within a colony. So when we're looking at this particular disease in our beehives and apiaries, we need to assess the loading that um, each of those colonies and apiaries are going to have. And we can do that um, very simply using some basic microscopy equipment. And uh, I'm very grateful to Brunel Microscopes who have been supporting me in producing some of my microscopy videos. And please do take a look at some of those. However, if you're a beekeeper with just a few colonies, it's very easy to assess each individual colony. And you might only have one apiary and it might be at the bottom of your garden. So it's gonna be very straightforward to actually test each of the hives and we need to look at some practical ways in which you can make that assessment and not get hooked up on whether or not it's a low, medium or high infection rate, whether you should or you shouldn't do something about it. From my perspective, if any of my bees have got an infection, then I want to do something about that. And whether it be a low, medium or high infection uh, and whether the bees perhaps can deal with it themselves, I have an integrated pest management program which I follow uh, and I think that that helps a great deal in terms of keeping levels of infections like Nosema at a very low level and in some instances not being in an apiary at all. So let's look at a practical way in which we can check out an apiary, assess the colonies and then take a sample and we'll then take that sample and in the next video we'll look at how I take those samples back to my home 
and actually look at them under the microscope. But for today, we're just gonna go and have a look at the beehives and take a sample. And then next time we'll have a look at how we actually assess the samples for Nosema infection. So in this apiary, we've got uh, just five hives and we've taken the chicken wire woodpecker guards off them. I came over a couple of days ago uh, just checking up to make sure the bees were flying and I noticed that the colony closest to us here didn't have many bees flying. All the other colonies had lots of bees flying quite freely. It was a, a warm sunny day, uh, not unlike today. Yet this nearest colony was very quiet and going into the autumn they were a really strong colony. You can see that we've actually given them an extra super of food underneath because there were so many bees in there. So as a beekeeper I'm thinking something might have gone wrong here. There may be a problem with this colony. So we're going to earmark this one specifically as potentially having a problem. Uh, the others, the bees are flying really well. They're bringing back uh, midwinter pollen from various plants. We've got gorse and crocuses and snowdrops just locally here. So I'm pretty certain that the bees are on that. So I'm not too worried about the other colonies. But where you've got several beehives, it allows you to compare and contrast each colony. And in this instance, we think we may have a problem with this near colony. So it might not be a Nosema problem. It might be something completely unrelated, but we're going to specifically look at this one as if there may be a Nosema problem. But we'll sample all of the colonies regardless uh, so I'm going to get my suits on and then I'll show you how I'm going to sample the bees. So we're all ready to take some samples now. I've got my sample containers all ready and in here I've got a small piece of tissue and about two mils of ethyl acetate and that's going to kill the sample of bees that I put in there very rapidly. Uh, I've already marked up the tube with the apiary identifier and today's date and then as we get to each individual hive I'll then mark it up with the hive identifier or the queen identifier as I use and then we know exactly where it's come from. So in terms of the sample number traditionally I've always taken a sample of 30 bees and that for me has always produced an adequate indicator as to whether the colony has an infection uh, simply yes or no and that's really from a practical viewpoint all that I'm interested in. Uh, I don't really need to get into the science of it, I don't really need to know whether um, a smaller number of bees will give me uh, a positive because you can get false positives. So with any um, infection within the colony, uh, depending on the sample of bees that you take, you could find yourself in a position where you happen to take uh, one particularly heavily infected bee and that can skew the um, result that you have. Uh, for me, if I've got one heavily infected bee in the colony, I've probably got lots more. So I would rather take action than to uh, maybe assume that the colony is not quite that badly infected. Uh, so I'm really only looking for a yes or no kind of result. Uh, however, there are a lot of different options out there and lots of websites and other views as to what you should and shouldn't take in terms of sampling. So today I'm going to take a sample of 50 bees and then on uh, this first hive that we've got in particular, I'm going to run a sample when we get back home of each individual bee and I'm going to check each individual bee and, and then we'll log to see how that sample uh, comes out. But for all of the others, I'm just going to take a standard sample of 30 bees and then we'll uh, again analyse those and see whether we have a yes or no infection. So this is the colony that's causing me the most concern. You can see at the entrance uh, we've currently got absolutely uh, minimal activity. There's one or two bees coming in or out. There's one just returning. So now if we have a look at a couple of the other colonies, you'll see the difference in activity. And you can see on the front of this colony, we've a small cluster of bees and they've been coming 
in and out quite regularly and uh, being quite active. And then finally, the third in this little group again has bees flying actively backwards and forwards from the hive. And that compares well with the first colony that we looked at and that's why I'm concerned about the first colony. So there's lots of different ways that you can take a sample um, but what we're really looking for are the older bees, the flying bees and generally in a winter cluster they tend to be bees that are towards the outside of the cluster. So you can block up the entrance and capture bees that are flying back from having been out on maybe toilet flights or going and getting some pollen or water to bring back to the hive. But where they're not flying, I find the easiest method is to just take off the roof uh, and if you've got a block of fondant you can move that to one side and the bees will come up generally through the top of the crime board and then you can take samples from there. So that's what I'm going to do. We've not got many flying bees here so we're going to have a look under the roof and see if we can't pick some samples up uh, from the top. So here we don't have any any fondant on this one so I'm just going to pick up 50 bees and pop them into the tube that I've got ready. We've collected all of our samples from the five colonies. We've got our five individual tubes with the sample bees in, and we're going to take those back now and we'll analyze those to see whether any of the colonies have got a nosema infection. And the details of the uh, examination that we're now going to carry out, we'll post in a video coming up really soon. If you haven't yet subscribed, please do consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and also remember we have our Facebook group which is called Stuart's Beekeeping Basics where we've got lots of people now chatting about uh, beginner beekeeping tips and techniques and helping each other out which is fantastic. We've also got our Instagram account and Twitter feed and don't forget finally that if you'd like to catch up with all of the videos that we're going to be producing from March onwards to pop over to our Patreon page and sign up for just one dollar a month to get three videos per week. We're going to head back home now, grab a cup of coffee and start analysing these bees and we'll catch up next time. Thanks for watching.